Fleming. Um, but, you know, defensively, there's like a lot of question marks, holes, weird things they did on the depth chart. You know, you look at uh, Devontae Downs as of now is going to start next to Blake Martinez, um, at least until David Mayo gets back, if not after that. Uh, and take that would make Tate Crowder the top backup, and he's a s- Mr. Irrelevant. Um, at safety, this isn't a huge surprise, but it was just interesting to see they had Logan Ryan as the backup to Julian Love. That's just for now, I imagine, while uh, Logan Ryan gets uh, adjusted. And an edge rusher, I thought it was maybe the most interesting on the defensive depth chart was that they had Marcus Golden as a backup to Lorenzo Carter and O'Shane Zimon as uh, in front of uh, Kyler Fackrell. I mean, they're going to rotate those guys all in, but I just found it interesting that Golden wasn't the listed starter there. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that they're certainly going to try to push Lorenzo Carter to have that third year breakout. And I thought that he had a really strong camp, not just in the scrimmage, but he kind of stood out during practices as well. There's another guy with Marcus Golden. It feels like a matter of time that he's going to be at the top of that depth chart. And, you know, what's really interesting, Zach, is even after averaging, I believe, 36 sacks each of the last two years, only 30 sacks two years ago, 38 last year, it it just really feels like the Giants have almost ignored pass rusher. I know they took Zimenez in the third round last April and they took Carter in the third round the year prior and they brought Marcus Golden back at the last minute and they signed Kyler Fackrell. But you're looking at uh, a pass rush by committee. And I don't know that that works in today's NFL. You look at Marcus Golden last year, high energy, high motor guy, double digit sacks. I'll go out on a limb. If you want to talk about making bold predictions, I don't know how if this is even all that bold. I don't know that there's a double-digit sack guy on this defense because they're just going to rotate through those outside linebackers. And and to me, I, I don't know how you set the tone up front as a defense without having that dominant Cam Hayward, Chandler Jones, you know, Shaq Barrett type of pass rusher that is going to generate consistent pressure to really power your defense and take pressure off your secondary. The Giants don't seem to have that guy as of now. Maybe Carter develops into that. Maybe O'Shane Zyman has develops into that. But I didn't really see O'Shane take a lot of steps during the preseason. I thought that Carter was the standout of that group. But you're not even talking about a top-tier pass rusher on this defense. Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious they're banking on those guys living up to the potential that they saw in them when they drafted them, which is a risk because if they're not up to the task, then they don't really have a backup plan. You know, Kyler Fackrell, he has a proven that he's capable of being a productive pass rusher, especially when Patrick Graham coaches him. He had 10 and a half sacks a couple of years ago or whatever it was, but he only had one and a half sacks last year. So none of these guys outside of Marcus Golden have been productive pass rushers really in the NFL <laughs> last year. And even Golden, you know, he he's he's had a weird career where it's like every other year he is not productive, and that would leave this year being that one. Um, so it's going to be interesting, especially like if a guy like him gets injured, like they don't really have – like is Carter Coughlin going to be playing a lot all of a sudden? Is Cam Brown, who clearly wasn't isn't ready yet? Like it, that's been – that's a big question. I think linebacker as a whole – I think we both agree may be like the worst position group on this roster at this point, especially we didn't even mention this yet, but they cut Ryan Connolly pretty shockingly, I would say, considering he looked really good last year before he got injured. Um, I know he was working his way back. He missed a lot of practice. He started to look like he was getting some of his athleticism back towards the end. And then they just straight up cut him and he got claimed by the Vikings. And so the guy that was projected to be their starting inside linebacker is gone and Devontae Downs is in there. And he's a guy that's only he never even played a defensive snap at the NFL and he's in his third year. So the linebacker group as a whole, counting edge rushers and inside, like I, I have serious concerns about it. Yeah, I think that Blake Martinez is going to be an upgrade over Alec Ogletree in a lot of areas. I think he's marginally better in coverage. He's a lot better against the run. And that's where I think maybe it's six year half dozen over there. But you're right. You start to talk about Devontae Downs as a starter in this league, you know, kind of as a bridge to get you to David Mayo if and when David Mayo gets healthy enough to return. Uh, I mean, listen, you could talk all you want about the concerns at cornerback, and we certainly will. I think that the, the right cornerback position might be the weakest position on any depth chart in the NFL, but linebacker has been a weakness for this team for several years. And they tried, they went out and they threw a bunch of money at Blake Martinez. They drafted three guys late, but it's a little bit different drafting three guys late than drafting 
a linebacker in round two, right? Or bringing in two marquee big money free agents when you had the cap space to spend. And I know that Rome wasn't built in a day, but if Dave Gettleman and the Giants believe that you win and lose in the trenches, it's one thing to have a dominant defensive line, which the Giants have a chance to have with arguably their strongest depth chart position on the roster with Dexter Lawrence and Dalvin Tomlinson and Leonard Williams. But that linebacker play helps in that area too, especially if they're going to be generating pressure on the quarterback. So again, it's a rebuild. It's a long term process but i'm with you they they're they have bodies at linebacker i don't even know that you can say that they have depth at linebacker right now yeah i mean in jumping off that i guess so when you look at this depth chart as a whole and this roster as a whole and everything we now know about them after watching training camp like has your feelings about how the season's going to play out changed at all you know that's tough because I i don't think that anybody who they cut other than maybe Ryan Connolly and to a far lesser extent, Grant Haley. I don't think I expected any of these guys to play vital roles on this team that you kind of churn through the bottom of the roster as they had been doing over the last two weeks. So I don't know that my expectations based on cuts changed. I mean, I'm a little bit worried about this offense, and it could be a case of Jason Garrett and Daniel Jones playing the cards really close to the vest and not showing anything during training camp and just installing basic plays and base schemes and not really putting anything out there in front of the media that w- would you know lead to a lot of excitement and kind of keep that under wraps before the opener. But I think my biggest concern is the turnovers for Daniel Jones are still present. The offensive line is going to be uh, a work in progress. And it's not just because Andrew Thomas is a rookie and Cam Fleming's a Band-Aid. Zach, these guys haven't had any practices all offseason. No OTAs, no mini camps. The only time they got to spend together was virtually through Zoom. Offensive lines take time to develop that chemistry and cohesion. The Giants don't have that and they didn't have the luxury of that time. So I think that after watching this team, I'm not going to say that I've changed my win-loss prediction, but I think that any optimism that I had of Jones taking that big leap forward and not just a step forward kind of eroded a little bit during training camp. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, you know, that's the tough part. You know, we don't know if Jones is just going to be a bad practice player and he figures it out when he gets on when the lights go on and he goes out on the field on Monday night. Um, but yeah, I mean, Daniel Jones, you know, we've talked about this on pretty much every episode since I joined. He he's going to decide how the season goes. It, not Joe Judge, not even Saquon, not the defensive players. It, it's if Daniel Jones is good, they're going to win more than four games. And if he th- turns the ball over too much, they might win four games again. Yeah, I spoke to Brian Baldinger this week for kind of an in-depth preview on. Daniel Jones. And he thinks that when you look at his season, you could be looking at 4,000 yards, 30 to 35 touchdowns, but the problem is going to come in with the turnovers. I mean, nobody fumbled the ball more than Daniel Jones did a year ago as a quarterback. He had something like 11 interceptions. Those are just too many turnovers. And it's one thing to put up a bunch of yards and a bunch of touchdowns. And you kind of expect that with the weapons that he has around him with Darius Slayton and Saquon and Ingram and Shepard and Tate. It's what do you do protecting the football that's going to determine whether Jones is a quarterback in rate, you know, quarterback 15 to 18 in the NFL, or if he's a top 10 to top 12 passer, which, you know, there, there's a lot of reason with his arm strength, his poise in the pocket, his command of the offense, his command of his teammates, the ability to lead comeback drives and fourth quarter drives last year. All of those things are things that you're excited about and encouraged about and make you think that, okay, this guy's ceiling might be that he's a top 10 quarterback in the league, but until he cuts the turnovers, That's going to be the big what if that follows him until he's able to do it or not. So going off that, I guess, so if, say if he does, like if he cuts the turnovers in half, like how many wins do you think the Giants get? Oh boy, if he cuts the turnovers in half and you think that the key turnovers last year, the Lions game, he had a fumble that was returned for a touchdown. He had a couple of bad picks against the Jets. I think you could say, see the Giants winning eight or nine games, I would think. Yeah, and, and so then if he doesn't cut it in half, then probably closer to what you actually predicted, right? Correct. Yes. <laughs> How <laughs> about would you? you have, I, mean, I had them at seven and nine, I believe, at the end, or no, six and ten. Sorry, I had them at. Yeah, six I, have, and 10. I have them at six and ten as well. I, and, and I swear that we didn't, you know, collaborate no, or discuss yeah. our picks ahead of time. Yeah, I, I think it's just like they're they're scheduled. Like, there's definitely winnable games on it, but it, again, and like. Like winnable games like the Browns, for example, but the Browns have a lot of weapons, and I don't know if the Giants have the defense to defend those weapons. So 
And the well, Bears too. I mean, the Bears are yeah, the Bears their, are their quarterback situation's a mess. They're starting Mitchell Trubisky, but even if they go to Nick Foles by week two, which seems unlikely, you're still dealing with Khalil Mack and a pretty dominant defensive line on the heels of playing a Steelers front seven that includes Cam Hayward and J.J. Watt and Bud Dupree. So it, the, the schedules, schedule makers didn't really do the Giants any favors at all with these first two games. And then you have the defending NFC champion San Francisco 49ers and then a trip out west to the Rams. Yeah, the first four are tough. It, it's brutal. And, and you, you talk about a quarterback trying to find his footing and work on ball security against a defense that produced 58 sacks a year ago and, and is prone to punching out the ball. Khalil Mack, who's a game wrecker. And then you have Nick Bosa and that front seven, you know, looming in week three. You want to have a litmus test or a barometer for what Daniel Jones is? No, no better barometer than this first quarter of the season. I mean, even the fifth game, they go to Dallas and play the Cowboys, yeah. who have a pretty elite pass rush as well. So that's like five games team in too. a row, you know, Aaron Donald in week four, where yeah. Daniel Jones is probably going to be under pressure. So we're going to find out how much better he really is at holding on to the football. Um, I mean, how, how are you feeling about this going to the Steelers game? I know it seems like a lot of Giants fans are getting pretty confident in this game, but I'm, I'm a little more skeptical for I don't think they really match up very well with the Steelers. Um, I'm sure we'll get into that more in more depth, but like, what's your general feeling going into this game? No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm not sure where the giants have an advantage other than maybe special teams. I think the giants, uh, in terms of their special teams ranking last year, were a top five special teams unit in the league and the Steelers, you know, weren't on that level. Um, you're going to see a lot of Saquon Barkley, I would think. And I just look at this across the board, Steelers front seven against the Giants offensive line. You have to give the advantage to the Steelers front seven. You look at the Giants receivers against the secondary for Pittsburgh. I mean, Minka Fitzpatrick could have a field day back there. And then it comes down to what's Daniel Jones able to do if he's under a barrage of pressure all night long. I'm not really optimistic about this game. I, I'm not really optimistic about the offense getting off the ground. But again, if they were just, you know, rope doping us during training camp and they come out and they run trick plays and Saquon Barkley's throwing the ball and Daniel Jones is lined up out wide and you're throwing all kinds of looks where the Steelers are kind of caught napping, you're thinking, what the heck is that? Maybe you have a chance. But if you're just going straight up, I think this defense against the Giants offense is a really bad matchup. And Ben Roethlisberger on a revenge tour against this Giants secondary is the mismatch of all mismatches, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest concern I have is the Juju Smith-Schuster matchup against this secondary. Um, Patrick Graham kind of didn't really answer when he was asked if like they would have someone follow him. Um, Juju, it sounds like he's going to play a lot in the slot this year for them which would line them up in theory with Darnay Holmes. I'm sure they would bring Logan Ryan or Julian Levin to help. But, you know, between that and all the speed they have on the outside of receiver, they have guys like James Washington and Deontay Johnson, and they have like a couple other guys, I believe. And Ben Roethlisberger has obviously been doing this for a very long time, and I'm sure he's he's just going to throw it away from James Bradbury and towards wherever Corey Ballantyne and Darnay Holmes are. And if those guys, if those young guys don't step up and play better than maybe we expect them to right away, uh, this could be a really high scoring game in the bad direction. Yeah, and I think that that's what the Giants would probably like to avoid, right? And we've heard Dave Gettleman all offseason talk about how they want to be a ground and pound team and how much he believes that you win with running the football and dominating the trenches. Well, well guess what? They're losing the battle of the trenches on both sides of the line of scrimmage. But if the Giants can set the tone early and you can commit to running the football with Saquon Barkley and he's able to get some push. And I think one of the things that encouraged me the most about the offense during the summer, Zach, is that I thought Andrew Thomas looked really good in terms of run blocking. And I think that this offensive line is probably better suited as run blockers right now than pass protectors. And you look at the Steelers last year, they had the 14th ranked rushing defense in the league, allowing 109 yards per game but over the last three they averaged 146 yards against per game so my point is that we all kind of laugh at establishing the run especially in an era of the nfl where the passing game kind of reigns supreme but if they can put together a 14 15 18 play drive of just ground and pound running the football with saquon barkley and you know saquon it can go three yards three yards five yards 55 yards and, and you have a big play on your hands, then maybe you can keep this thing competitive and build on that. But 
other than that, if you get caught in a track meet with this Steelers team, if you get caught with Daniel Jones having to throw the ball 30, 35 yeah. times against that front seven, it's going to be a long night. Yeah, you know, it's it's going to be – this is supposed to be like the, the next stage of Saquon's greed. He had, he had some interesting quotes today where, you know, he's talking about how he wants to be a complete back. He wants to be one that, you know, can do everything, can be a good pass protector, can be a um, good pass catcher. And he wants to be someone who's, you know, not scared to break tackles. And he, he I think he mentioned Walter Payton as a 